Welcome to the second lecture of chapter one. Um, today we are going to continue on with matter, measurement, and problem solving. So last time we talked about matter, and we talked about matter is, you know, just kind of another word for stuff. It's anything that has mass and occupies space. Well, we can classify matter into two different categories. One of these categories is pure substances. And from pure substances, we can break that down further into elements um, like this here. It looks like copper or compounds. And this here looks like sugar. Um, but again, these would be pure substances. So like if you go to the store and you buy a bag of sugar, right, we would hope that that is a pure substance and that is a compound, right, because there is more than one element that has been bonded together. Whereas the copper, on the other hand, like maybe copper wire, that is another pure substance, but that is just a single element, just the copper in the wire. So if we have more than one substance, then we get into mixtures, which is on the other side. Um, and so we can have two different types of mixtures. One type of mixture is a homogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture. Uh, and this looks to be soda. And so we've got water, we've got maybe some sugar and some other things that are in there. Um, and then we also, on the other side, have a heterogeneous mixture. Whereas you're seeing there are two separate layers. This looks to be water and it looks like oil on the top. Um, and if you, you know, oil and water don't mix, right? You can mix them for just a minute, um, but they won't stay mixed. They will separate into these two layers. Um, in order to be a heterogeneous mixture, it doesn't have to separate into two layers, but it just can't look the same throughout. Like another example of a heterogeneous mixture is sand, right? Sand doesn't look the same throughout. You can see the individual particles and they're different. Or you could think of like, um, like a salad or something like that, right? That is also a heterogeneous mixture. Homogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures will look the same throughout, like soda. You can't see the individual pieces in the soda. Some of it's not darker than other pieces. Um, or you could think of maybe milk, right? Milk is a homogeneous mixture. Um, so these are our four different categories of matter. Our pure substances, elements, or compounds, and our mixtures. They're homogeneous, like I said, will look the same throughout, or heterogeneous. You can see the individual particles, or it'll, it'll look different. Okay, physical properties versus chemical properties. Um, and so these are ways that we can um, characterize matter. So some physical properties are properties a substance displays without changing its composition. So just by looking at the substance, what can you tell about it? Or, um, you know, by heating it up or cooling it down. So some examples of physical properties are things like luster. Is it shiny or is it dull? Um, is it malleable, right? Can you hit it with a hammer? Um, what color is it? Uh, what's its melting point? What's its boiling point? Um, and so these, the melting and boiling point, people often um, think those are chemical properties because they're like, ah, you're doing something to your substance, right? You're changing it. Well, you're not changing it, right? If you think about ice, ice is frozen water, frozen H2O. And if you melt it, now it becomes liquid H2O. But it's still H2O, right? We haven't changed the compound. We haven't changed its composition. We've changed its state of matter, but we haven't changed its composition. So physical properties are things you can, or you can talk about your substance without changing the composition. But again, you can change the phase of matter. Chemical properties though, are properties a substance displays only through changing its composition. And this is usually has to do with reactivity. Okay, so how does it react with different things? Does it react with water or does it not? Does it act as a base or does it act as an acid? Um, things like that. Those are chemical properties. So those would be things that you would see in reactions, whereas physical properties, like I said, are things you can um, learn about your substance without changing the composition. So here's a bunch of physical properties. There are lots, right? We've got mass, we've got volume, you know, we've got odor, um, taste, right? But don't taste anything in the lab, at least this one's we're online. Um, solubility, right? Does it dissolve? Um, ductility, right? Um, specific heat capacity. All of these things are physical properties. They are things you can understand about your substance without changing its composition. It appears my screen has frozen. Oh, there we go. 
Chemical properties. Um, so here are some chemical properties. Like I said, um, these are things you can tell about your substance by changing the composition, by reacting it with something else. Um, so does it act as an acid? Does it act as a base? Is it corrosive? Um, is it inert, which means it doesn't react with things? Is it explosive? Is it flammable, right? Can it combust? All of these things are, um, are chemical properties, but the only way we can find these out is by changing the composition, by reacting it with something or by combusting it, right? Um, so these will change your, uh, the composition of your substance, whereas physical properties do not. Similar, right? So those are physical properties and chemical properties. These are physical changes and chemical changes. So they're similar, they're related, um, but not the same. So a physical change is when matter changes the appearance, but not the composition. So again, what we were talking about before, right? All of those physical properties. So if we can change one of those physical properties, but not the composition, then that is uh, a physical change. So this would be something like a phase change, right? Um, that would be a physical change. So boiling, right? I'm just going to put peas. These are for physical. Boiling and melting are both physical changes where matter is changing the appearance, but not the composition, right? You could also um, maybe crush up your matter. That would be another physical change um, or dissolve it, right? Uh, chemical change is when a substance changes into a completely new substance. It has totally different properties, totally different composition than the original substance. So this, these two, these are chemical changes. Um, in the first picture for that chemical change, we have iron nails or screws, um, and they appear to have rusted, which means that the iron reacted with the oxygen in the air and produced iron three oxide, better known as rust, right? And so that is a chemical change. Um, the iron reacted with some oxygen and made iron three oxide, okay? So it's no longer iron and oxygen, now it's rust. Um, and over here on the egg, right, eggs um, has been cooked, right? We've changed the chemical composition of the egg by heating it, right? You wouldn't eat a raw egg, um, but you would eat a cooked egg. It's totally different, has totally different properties. And you're also not going to get salmonella that way. So here are our seven characteristics of a chemical change. These are seven ways that you will know that a chemical change has occurred. Anytime a chemical change happens, one or more of these also happens, okay? So here they are, so gas production or bubbles. If your reaction starts bubbling, and I want you to be careful here um, because people will often see uh, like water boiling and they're like, ah, bubbles, gas production, must be a chemical change. Nope. When, the, um, when you heat up water, the bubbles are water vapor because the water is going into the gas phase. So, the, the water bubbling is not a characteristic of a chemical change. Um, it's not producing gas, it's changing into a gas, which is slightly different. So that's why I put this one first. That one's a little bit tricky. Um, people get a little bit tripped up on that. But just think to yourself, is this boiling? If the answer is no, then you have gas production. If the answer is yes, then you're just, you know, changing it into a gas. You're um, changing its state of matter, which would be a physical change. The next one is light production. Um, that one's really cool. If you've ever um, lit magnesium, that will produce a really bright light. Super cool. Um, the next one, unexpected color change. So if you, um, we, we do this cool lab, it's copper lab, and the copper goes through all these different color changes. It goes from red to blue to green to black. It's awesome. Um, but these color changes are because the copper is changing its oxidation state. Um, and so that would be an unexpected color change. And by unexpected, I mean, like, if you put blue food coloring in water, you would expect the water to be blue. That would not be an unexpected color change. That's not a chemical change. That's just you put blue stuff in water, and now the water's blue. Um, but if you put, you know, blue food coloring into your water and it turned, I don't know, green, that would be an unexpected color change. You'd be like, ah, there's something in the water that the blue dye has reacted with, right? That would be a characteristic of a chemical change. So that's what that unexpected means. Uh, and then an odor change, if it smells, you know, one way and then it smells a different way, um, that would be an odor change. Maybe like um, baking, right? Baking is a chemical change and you can smell like when your muffins are done. Uh, endothermic, uh, if your reaction feels cold to the touch, that would be an endothermic reaction. It's absorbing the heat from your hand and transferring it 
to the reaction, which is really cool. Um, your reaction actually will sometimes get cold, but the reason it feels cold to the touch is that it has taken all of the heat out of your hand and your hand actually gets colder while you're holding it because um, your reaction is absorbing the heat, which is neat. And then the opposite, exothermic, is when your reaction will feel hot to the touch because it's producing heat. Heat is exiting your reaction, therefore it is exothermic. Whereas the other one, endothermic, right, your reaction is taking in heat. Um, so there's just some ways to remember those. And then the last one, formation of a precipitate. And we'll deal with this a lot when we talk about solubility. Um, and formation of a precipitate occurs when you have two clear liquids. And by clear, I mean that you can see through them. Not that they're just like clear like water. They may be blue or they may be green or whatever color they are, but that you can see directly through them. There's nothing floating in them. They're, you know, um, they're, they're clear. Um, and when you pour two liquids together and a solid forms or they get really cloudy, right? Um, that would be formation of a precipitate. Something has formed. A solid has formed from two liquids, and that's indicative of a chemical change. Something has been produced from that reaction. Okay, units of measurement. So in chemistry, we have units, right? Standard quantities that are used to specify measurements, and these are critical. If you do not include units on your, you know, your homework, your quizzes, your tests, your labs, you will lose points. You must have a unit. Anytime you write a number, it must have a unit and it must have the right number of significant figures, but more on that later. We have two really common unit systems, um, metric system and the English system. The metric system is used in most of the world. I think it's used in the entire world except for three countries and the United States happens to be one of them. We use the English system where we use things like inches and feet and pounds and all that good stuff. Um, in chemistry, we will typically use the metric system or we will use the SI system, the international system of units. Uh, and the SI system is based on the metric system. So those kind of go hand in hand. But we will not use the English system whatsoever in chemistry um, because chemistry is a universal language. So we need to be able to communicate with the rest of the world. So we use the metric system because literally the rest of the world uses it. So here are some units. Um, so for length, we'll use meter, mass, we'll use kilogram, time, we'll use seconds, temperature, we will use Kelvin, sometimes we will also use uh, Celsius, we'll use um, moles for amounts of stuff, and then I in include these last two, um, electric current, we use amperes, and then luminous intensity, we use candelas, which we don't use at all really in chemistry, but how cool is that that it's named after a candle? Anyway, really commonly in chemistry, we will use uh, kilograms or grams, right? And we'll use Kelvin uh, and Celsius. So again, this is, this is SI and our base unit for SI um, are these. I'm going to make a note here. If I ever ask you to list the SI units, people are really, really good about getting those correct, except for mass. For mass, everyone says grams because that would be, you know, like a base unit, right? Because here, kilogram has a prefix. And so people naturally are like, oh, it has a prefix that can't be the SI unit. It's got to be grams. Well, okay, you'd be mistaken though. Um, our base unit for SI is kilograms. So just make yourself a note um, that that one is different. Okay, a little bit about Kelvin. Um, if you haven't heard of the Kelvin temperature scale, this is your introduction to it. Um, the Kelvin is the SI unit of temperature. In the metric system, we use Celsius, right? Degrees C. Um, and then, you know, in the United States, we use Fahrenheit, uh, which nobody else uses, and we won't be using in this class unless we are converting to Celsius or to Kelvin so that we can actually use it mathematically. All of our uh, chemical equations that we're going to use that deal with temperature will use either Celsius or or Kelvin. So you need to know how to get from Fahrenheit to Celsius and from Celsius to Kelvin. Um, so Kelvin uh, is kind of an um, absolute temperature scale, which means the lowest possible temperature in Kelvin is zero Kelvin. You cannot have negative degrees Kelvin. You just, you just don't. It's based on the fact that zero is the lowest possible temperature.
okay? Um, and a little bit about temperature on these other ones. Temperature always determines the direction of thermal energy transfer, or what we call heat. It's always going to go from a hot object to a cold object, never vice versa. So heat goes from hot to cold. Um, and temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the atoms. Um, and that we're going to get more into later when we do thermochemistry, but temperature just tells you how fast your molecules are moving, essentially. If your molecules are moving really fast, then you have a really high temperature. If your molecules are moving really slow, then you have a low temperature. So here's the Kelvin scale, right, as well as the Fahrenheit and Celsius. But the Kelvin scale, the lowest possible temperature is zero Kelvin, and we call this absolute zero. Um, and absolute zero is the lowest possible temperature. As of now, it's a theoretical temperature. We haven't actually reached it yet. They're at point something Kelvin, but they haven't quite got to zero yet. Um, and again, it's a theoretical temperature, um, but theoretically, at absolute zero, which is zero, zero Kelvin or negative 273 Celsius or negative 459 Fahrenheit would be the temperature at which all molecular motion virtually stops, okay? Um, we talked about in the last set of slides that solids, liquids, and gases are all moving. Even the solids are vibrating ever so slightly in place. But theoretically, at zero Kelvin, even this vibration would stop. So again, it's a theoretical temperature for now. We haven't quite reached it, um, but this would be the lowest possible temperature. So if I happen to ask, what's the lowest possible temperature? You would say zero Kelvin, um, or I may ask, you know, can you have a negative Kelvin temperature? And you would say no, because zero Kelvin is the, is the lowest. So a Fahrenheit degree is five ninths the size of a Celsius degree, which is great because everybody loves fractions. Um, so Fahrenheit degrees are slightly smaller than Celsius, but the Celsius degrees and the Kelvin degrees are the same. Um, and if you look here, the, the Celsius degree or the Celsius and Kelvin scales are always related by adding and subtracting 273, always. Um, so that, that's why we have these degrees being the same size. Um, the Kelvin scale is based on, like I said, the zero Kelvin. The Celsius scale is based on water. Water will freeze at zero degrees Celsius um, and water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So the Celsius scale was based on water and then we, we built the Kelvin scale from there um, by adding 273. And then Fahrenheit scale is just exciting in general. Um, so we can convert between the, the temperature scales with these formulas. So the first one is that degrees Celsius is equal to degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 over 1.8. Um, and then Kelvin is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273.15. Um, so those two formulas, right, you can rearrange and you could, you know, solve for um, anything. Um, so let's see. Let's see how this works out. This says the boiling point of neon gas is 27 Kelvin. What is its boiling point in Celsius and Fahrenheit temperatures? So here they are. You will need to know these, okay? It is unlikely that I would give you these formulas because you don't have anything else really to memorize yet. So why not memorize these formulas? Um, so we need to change them into um, Celsius and Fahrenheit. So we have one, this first one, we can go from Kelvin to Celsius by just rearranging that. So if we take our Kelvin, right, and we'll move that 273.15 to the other side. Um, so then we'll get Kelvin, right? We would have Kelvin minus 273.15 is equal to degrees Celsius. So we can do 27 minus 273.15, and that would get us negative 246.15, or rounded for significant figures, if you know your sig fig rules, um, this would be negative 246 degrees Celsius. If you're not familiar with significant figures or you don't remember them right now, that is okay. We will cover them soon. To get to Fahrenheit, we can now take our Celsius temperature, right, that negative 246, and we can plug it into that first equation. Um, so if we rearrange that, right, we'd have, um, you know, we need to multiply both sides by 1.8. So we'd get, you know, 1.8 
degrees Celsius, and then we'll add 32 to both sides to get our Fahrenheit by itself. Uh, and then we can plug in. So uh, 1.8 times negative 246 plus 32 will get us negative 411 Fahrenheit. Um, if you're familiar with sig figs, just brief digression. This 1.8, this is exact because it came from a fraction 5 ninths. Okay, um, well, well, I guess in this case, since we've rearranged it, 9 fifths. Um, but that is an exact number. Okay, so it's not playing into our significant figure rules. So out of this, we're still getting three significant figures out of this multiplication, and then we add 32, we'll still get this value here. Again, if you're not familiar with sig fig rules, don't worry about that for now. Just worry about trying to solve for the correct answer. And that is the end of chapter one, part two. Uh, start working on your Alex assignments so that you can, you know, uh, work on some of these things. And I will see you next time. Send me any questions you have.